So let's change gears. This is Cedric Price. Um, Cedric Price is a British architect. Um, if you're in a school of architecture and you've been here for a while, you probably are familiar with his work. If you're from outside of architecture, it's quite possible you've never heard of him. He was born in 1934. He died in 2003. He was a professor at the Architectural Association in London and maintained his own, pro his own um, practice throughout his entire life. His life partner was Eleanor Braun, who was in the Beatles movies and was the uh, inspiration for the song Eleanor Rigby, among other things. And he's famous for being provocative. Um, this is one of his his most famous words, technology is the answer, but what was the question? <laughs> One of the, and I should mention that most of his work was not built. Um, so it wasn't, some of it was intended to be a provocation, but most of it was designed as though it would have been built. So um, this is a drawing of the Fun Palace, which he worked on with the radical theater director, Joan Littlewood. Um, from 1963 to 1970, they tried to get it built. And it was a cybernetic theater learning space. The components of it were movable. It was intended to learn from its, um, its visitors over time. It intended to change them over time. In fact, if you can see this cybernetic chart um, on the right, you see that it says right here, input of unmodified people, <laughs> output of modified people. <laughs> he worked with a 27-member cybernetic committee with some of the most important cyberneticists in Great Britain on this project in order to try and bring it to life. I should mention that he's a lot of fun to work on. I've spent a lot of time in his archives. You think, find things like this. This is one of the buildings that was built, the Interaction Center, with uh, members of the Jungle Book. You find letters like this. It says, thank you for your letter, enclosing the illustrated brochure. This is for a light hovercraft company. We would very much like to see a demonstration. We'll get in touch with you in the near future to arrange this. So he was interested in novel forms of transportation. So hovercraft, helicopter, of course, why not? He also, as noted, he worked with cyberneticians, and one of the ones who had the biggest impact on him and on um, architecture in some very interesting ways in the 1960s is Gordon Pass. And Gordon Pass wrote in uh, an article in Ar in. Uh, <coughs> in uh, 1969, something that was a little bit different about how to think of the design process. Let us turn the design paradigm in upon itself. Let us apply it to the interaction between the designer and the system she designs, rather than the interaction between the system and the people who inhabit it. It's a different kind of approach to what you would expect from a design process. Pass can design things, and this is, I apologize for the um, pixelated nature here, but he designed things like the colloquy of moles, which was just recently, um, redesigned and relaunched and uh, mounted in Detroit by his protege, Paul Pangaro, Paul Pangaro um, a former member of the Architecture Machine Group at MIT. Um, these were shapes that you had to dance with and play with and sometimes play music with in order to attract them to you. And if you did too much of the same thing, they'd get bored and stop interacting with you. So you'd have to figure out a way to approach this boredom program. So this idea comes out in um, a piece by, uh, in a project by Cedric Price called Generator, which um, in 1976, he tried to get it built between 76 and 79. It was an arts retreat center in northern Florida, and it was a set of 12 foot by 12 foot cubes, <clears throat> excuse me, walkways, runways, and barriers. And they could be moved around and recombined however someone wanted to use them. You continually notice this idea Cedric Price was not going to define the architecture use, the architectural use that was for the people to decide. And there would be something to push back on those people to spur them to use the uh, projects in new and different ways. There were a set of previous menus, as he called them. He liked food metaphors a lot. So this is a menu imagining some of the possibilities for um, drama in generators. You see things like very good, walk around to all the angles and excellent, full of event and taught action. Um, Cedric's sketches are always really nice. Here's the mobile crane on the back of the index card. Here's how it would come together. There'd be a tartan grid that was laying on the ground. The mobile crane would drop the cubes into place. 
They'd be bonded together, roofs, sides, connections over the top. And then finally, people could come and put up, open up the front of their cubes and use them until they wanted to move them again. There were tools like this, little cubits to move them around. He envisioned bleeper, bleeper walks, and I'm not sure what's up with the mouse in the cube, but it's another interesting provocation. But he realized that at a certain point, people would be unlikely to request enough moves of generator. And so he got in touch with John and Julia Frazier and worked with them, um, they were programmers and architects, and worked with them on a set of programs to change things up a little bit. And John and Julia suggested putting microcontrollers on every piece of generator, running an architect program to keep the rules of the thing, of, of the um, of generator, a inventory program to know what all the pieces were and where, a design program, which is what you see here, these plexiglass blocks could be moved around and then it would be plotted on the computer and on the printer. And the fourth program was the boredom program. And what they said of that is, in the event of the site not being reorganized or changed for some time, the computer starts generating unsolicited plans and improvements. And John Frazier wrote to Cedric Price, if you kick a system, the very least you would expect it to do is kick you back. And then he writes in a postscript on, on this letter in, in pen, it seemed to imply that we were only useful if we produced results that you did not expect. I think this leads to some definition of computer aids in general. At least one thing that you would expect from any half-decent program is that it should produce at least one plan, which you did not expect. And this idea also has contemporary valence as well. We seem to keep kind of reinventing this idea. Um, Madeline Gannon, who uh, just received her PhD from the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon, is a robot whisperer. And without knowing about Cedric Price or Generator or John Frazier, she designed this robot and has this to say about it. comes together and you're in the space with the robot and you just have a very raw experience with this animal like machine responding to your every move. All the technical aspects sort of melt away to the background. It's incredibly important to have opportunities and spaces to come in and experiment and misuse these existing technologies. So here's this robot she tamed and uh, got to work with here at Pier 9 Autodesk and trained to interact with people in ways to change their expectations of what it could be and what robots and people could be. So as Cedric Price, we see ideas of cybernetic architecture early ideas of intelligent buildings, and technology is a provocation for thinking differently. And you also see a good uh, bunch of humor. Cedric Price's archive also is, it, Cedric Price's archive is at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal, as is his library. He had a habit of writing notes in his uh, books, and so you can check books out from the library, and one day I got Cedric Price's copy of the next architect, that I'm going to talk to you about, about his book um, being digital. And here's what Cedric Price had to say about being digital, a 1995 book by Nicholas Nicker Good. But dated. 